Uh, my name is Mattia Bonicelli, and today I will give you a quick introduction on robotic simulations with the help of the Gazebo software. So, uh, as Jan mentioned, I've been passionate about automation, controls, and robotics for a long time. I am currently studying at Tokai University. I am finishing up my Bachelor of Electrical and uh, Electronical Engineering. And uh, I've decided to join the Code Chrysalis Bootcamp to fill a bit of my uh, knowledge gap in software engineering to potentially prepare myself for a better career in robotics. So um, this presentation, I will get you up to speed on what robotic simulations are and why we use them. I will explain what the Gazebo simulation software is about and talk about its features. I will briefly introduce you to the uh, robot operating system. It's also known as ROS. And I will give you a quick tour of what the software looks like with a small showcase. So after that, I will show you what you can achieve with it through the DARPA challenge. And I will have a short overview of what the future holds for Gazebo. So let's get started. What are robotic simulations? So in the simplest terms, they are a way for engineers and scientists to get an accurate representation of what the system and model they are working on looks like in a digital environment. So they are usually reliant on a physics engine to provide an accurate representation of how a robot can interact with their surroundings and vice versa, how the environment conditions will affect the robot's operations. So they can be rendered in two dimensions. And you can think, for example, about maze-solving algorithms. You will just need the overview of the path and what the labyrinth looks like. So you can also render them in three dimensions. And this allows you to get a full picture of what's happening. So this is really powerful when using conjunction with rendering your sensor data. So as in the picture is showing, you could, for example, have a direct feed of a self-driving car and of its leader. And you could compare and see which sensor performs best under which conditions. So this type of simulations is really powerful, but it can also be quite taxing on the system you're running them on. It can be really expensive resource-wise. And so there is another type. It's called headless. What it means in short is that there will be a lot of number crunching going on in the background, but you won't be able to see any of it. So this is often useful when you are just trying to collect data from your sensors and you just want to save time and resources. So another crucial part of simulations is the fact that you have full control over how random the conditions are every time you run them. So there are a lot of different algorithms that allow you to generate random numbers to fit to your environment. And generally speaking, generating a truly random set of numbers is really complicated. You would have to rely on analog inputs that measure phenomena with a lot of entropy. So things like radioactive decay or thermal noise make good candidates. So for most projects, you will probably just want to use a pseudo random number generator. So they aren't truly random as they rely on mathematical equations and you can always trace the result back to the original formula. But the reason you would want to use those is because given the same input, you will always run into the same scenario. So this means that you can create a fully deterministic simulation. So knowing that your environment is never going to change is going to allow you to have a more stable iterative approach. So this doesn't really work that well when you're trying to move from the simulation to a physical robot because you're sacrificing potential real world performance to achieve academic optimization. So the most common of these pseudo random number generators algorithm is called a linear congruential generator. You don't need to understand it too much, but just know that it looks something like this. So what I really want you to bring home from here is that one of the important points of simulation is how versatile and adaptable they are to different use cases. 
So speaking of variety, uh, we are going to use Gazebo in particular and showcase what has been built on it. But I wanted to quickly mention a couple of other prominent simulation softwares. So they all have different sets of features. They all rely on different physics engines, have different 3D engines, and some have 3D modeling tools integrated in them. Some run only on certain operating systems and so on and so forth. So for example, OpenRave focuses on motion planning algorithms and it's done for testing, development, and deployment. So RoboDK instead is geared more towards the industrial side with manufacturing and assembly line operations in mind. Finally, SceneSpark focuses more on the academic side and in particular in multi-agent simulations. So what you're seeing in the picture is actually something that they hosted, which was called the RoboCup, and they had two teams of robots basically play soccer. So if you're interested in any of them, I will have some links for you later. So we learned a little bit about what simulations are. Let's take a look at what the advantages are. So perhaps the most important thing is that they allow you to rapidly prototype. So not relying on hardware means that you don't need to write data every time to the hardware. You don't need to compile it every single time. You don't need to gear up your robot with safety harnesses, data cables to check your real-time sensor data. And you don't need to spend hours to parse the data you've collected before you can try something new. So the lack of dependency on hardware is extremely favorable, not just from a time-saving perspective, but from a reliability and from a security point of view as well. So as simulations are used for robots that are in development and as complicated as the inner circuitry of these machines can get, malfunctions and erratic behavior that is caused purely by the physical components is to be expected. Furthermore, if your algorithms don't run as expected, it shouldn't be too surprising if your robot incurs some physical damage. So fixing it may take a long time in which you wouldn't be able to do any further testing. Security is another major issue. If you start thinking about flying robots or drones, you can, you can imagine all sort of damage that you could cause while testing something like that. So this actually brings me to the next point, which is regulations. So the ability to fly drones has been severely restricted in the past few years. And testing these requires you to get permits and to go into a big empty field. You are wasting a lot of time trying to do that. And you may also not be able to do that at all. No, not everyone lives close to a huge empty field. So the amount of red tape uh, gets even worse when you are working with something like self-driving vehicles. Acquiring the permissions to do a single day of real-world testing may easily take months, if not years, and it would hamper your ability to test massively. Another important capability about uh, simulation is that they provide context. As I mentioned, it's unrealistic to be able to test your robot frequently, and it's even more unrealistic to be able to test it in different environments and different weather conditions. It's also impossible to stress test your robot with extreme temperature or extreme forces applied to them without breaking them or without having to make a new one. So it's not just a lot of time you're investing into creating your robots, but it's also a lot of financial investment that goes into it. So cost effectiveness is a very important point Robotic simulations allow you to save a lot of money, and much more importantly, they lower the bar of entry to the industry. There have been a lot of universities that have started growing in their robotics departments, and they started putting in the field many more engineers than ever, thanks to this. So in the older days, 
everything also was custom. You needed to build everything you wanted to use. And what was effectively happening is that you needed to reinvent the wheel every time and spend a considerable amount of time working on the systems that would support the that would support building your robot, not actually building the robot. So simulations, maybe so you don't have to worry about that anymore. And you can just pick a platform and get started prototyping. So this is a use also extended to hobbyists, in particular with drones. And there are a lot of them that post fantastic tutorials that you can find on YouTube, for example. So let's talk about why Gazebo in particular. Why did I choose this? Let's find out what's special about it. So Gazebo is open source. Uh, if you felt so inclined, you could contribute to their GitHub repository right now. Uh, it has a vibrant community. There are a lot of free resources, libraries, and models that you can immediately throw into your simulations, and I will show you how to do it later. Gazebo also simulates real sensor parts and fills them with accurate data. So in short, this means that if you were to import your code from the simulation and run it directly on your real physical robot, it most likely will run out of the box with perhaps some minor tweaks needed. Lastly, um, Gazebo has been supported by many companies and has been used as a testbed for a lot of robotic challenges. Um, some of these have been issued by agencies such as DARPA and NASA. So this is a simulation software that is used to solve real issues, has been a serious contributor to the development of robotics itself. Uh, speaking of robotic challenges, you may have heard of Atlas. Uh, it's the robot from uh, Boston Dynamics. And the Gazebo simulator was chosen as the platform to further develop the robot. And the DARPA robotics challenges have been extremely important in doing this. Uh, we'll talk more about the DARPA challenges later. But for now, I just wanted to show you how athletic the robot is. OK, so earlier I mentioned uh, the robotic operating system. Uh, let's talk about what it is and what it does. So despite its name, it's not in fact an operating system, but it's rather a robotics middleware suit. So you can picture middleware as that gray layer sitting on top of the red nodes that would represent the hardware. And it will take care of interpreting your code written in high-level languages. Those would be the blue nodes. And what this essentially allows you to do is have low-level control from a high-level language. So you could control the, the voltage of your robot directly from something like C++ and Python. So speaking of languages, uh, RS has official support for writing in C++ and Python. But the community has a lot of well-maintained packages for different languages. Uh, you can even write <laughs> robots algorithm with JavaScript for a node. So to talk a little more about um, ROS as a system and how it works, um, each ROS process is represented by a node in a graph data structure. The edges are called topics and allow nodes to communicate with each, uh, with each other by passing messages and by calling each other's services as well. So this is also called a publish subscribe pattern. And uh, to explain it in short, this means that nodes can offer publishing services for certain informations and other nodes can subscribe to them. So when a node publishes an information, that information is immediately received by all subscribing nodes. So you could, for example, take a self-driving robot and think of the scenario every time that the sensors on the robot detect an obstacle in its path, the sensor will publish this information and the motors controlling the wheels of the robot will be listening for that in order to know when to stop. So uh, let's take a, a brief look at what Gazebo actually looks like when you first set it up. And then we will see how it's used in a real example. So this is what you will be greeted when you start Gazebo. 
Um, the UI resembles a 3D model editing software like Maya or 3ds Max, if you are familiar with those. And um, this isn't a coincidence. In fact, you can edit models inside here. So to start out, I made a simple scene with a couple of models. And I just want to show you that you can add models. And they have physics tied to them. So let's drop a sphere inside the cube. And um, you can see that it gets pushed out of the bounding box. Now let's add one more. And you can see that it's starting to roll. So one more thing you can do is that you can pause the simulations down here. And you can even control the speed. It's what the real-time factor stands for. So Gazebo allows you to quickly add models from repositories, as I mentioned before. And it's set up to it right out of the box. So let's get something from the main repository, for example. Um, also, you can access local repositories if you were so inclined. So let's add a um, Kuka Yuba. So you can see that it gets pushed up from the ground, so it already has physics right away. And if you go into the details of the robot, you can see that it has a lot of links and joints. And you can control each one like a physical robot. Also, you can expose them by changing the view and make the robot transparent. And you can see that you can control each one individually and they all represent a specific part of the robot, like a real one. So um, let's try exerting some force on a wheel of the robot. So we are going to do that by changing the pose on the X axis. And as uh, soon as we do that, you can see that the robot is reacting to it. And it's still respecting the the boundaries of its joints. So let's try doing the same on its base. And uh, let's change the, the yaw a bit. You can see that it's rotating. OK, so um, now while you can do this manually, the, the whole idea of robotic simulations is to be able to do it with code. So you can interface via to gazebo with ROS or many other um, middlewares. Uh, I won't be showing this today. It's a bit beyond the scope of, scope of the demo. But I just want to show you one last thing. Um, so let's, let's add a car. And uh, this car is a little special. It has sensors already bound to them. And uh, let's put it a little on the side. And let's go back to the word view. So you can see those blue boxes. Uh, those represent what the sensor's range is. And as the ball keeps rolling, what I want you to notice is how the leader of the car show what it's seen. And you can see you can see the, the rays being stopped by the ball rolling in real time. So uh, that was it for the showcase. Uh, let's talk a bit about the DARPA challenge. So the DARPA challenge was a competition taking place in 2015, in which teams from all over the world competed against each other for prize money and to solve real issues. So the goal of the challenge was split over a few tasks. The first one was to get the robot inside the cart and to make it drive it. So what's important to know here is that the robot doesn't have to be self-driving itself. It can be teleoperated. And the focus here is to provide near real-time input streaming and minimizing latency as much as possible. So there are some obstacles along the course, and uh, it is necessary to have this minimal latency to be able to not crush the robot into them. So uh, once the robot reaches the end of the stage, it will have to get out of the car safely, and it will be able to move to the next stage. Here, it will have to move around a very simple indoor scenario. And this is just to check that everything is working correctly up to that point. And once it's over that, it will have to traverse a terrain that is much softer. So here, the weight of the robot will influence how much it will sink at each step. And balance becomes a, a, a real issue. So once the robot clears that, 
and we'll have to walk towards this bumpy ground. Here the rating is hard, but it's uneven. So finish that section, it will have to get through these bricks laying on the ground. Uh, so it is fair to just push them aside to clear your path. The requirement here is to just get through an arm. So once you are clear in this section, you will move on to the next stage. So this is the most complex and it tries to emulate a real world scenario. So the robot will have to attach a water hose to a pipe and simulating turning the water on by opening the valve. So the complexity here is given by the fact that the water hose is a flexible item, which is very complicated to correctly grasp. And uh, being able to grasp that also means that you will need to turn the handle with the same time of arms. So here you can see the teams using the simulation software to control and command the physical robots. As I mentioned before, teleoperation is allowed. And uh, what most of these, these teams did was testing their algorithm with the simulation environment that I just showed you. And when we had to switch to the real world scenario, they still use the simulation software. So by doing this, they were able to see not only what their eyes can see, but also what the sensors of the robot were experiencing in the real world. So at the same time, we were also able to feed inputs to the real robot from within the digital world. And um, I believe this kind of crosstalk really shows how powerful robotic simulations are. So what does the future hold for Gazebo? What you need to know is that Gazebo is really old ancient by software standards. Uh, its rendering engine is also quite dated and we are both ready for retirement. So Gazebo started as a component in a, another simulator in 2004. And uh, since then it grew into its own product. But the latest Gazebo version came out in January 2019 and will only be supported until 2025. So, since the last version came out, the team has fully focused on the development effort of uh, a new version. And uh, this one will be in main maintenance mode till it retires. So this new version is by the same team at Open Robotics that has worked on both Gazebo and ROS, and it's called Ignition. Uh, it has already been released but it still lacks the community support and the vast library that Gazebo has, but it's growing out fairly rapidly and its features looks bright. So that was it for my tech talk. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining me. If you have any questions or just want to interact, you can find more of me by scanning that QR code or by following that link. Um, finally, if you'd like a deeper look at some of the topics we've mentioned today, uh, you can find more at the links displayed here. Uh, I will now hand you back to our MC. I uh, hope you will continue to enjoy our mini conference. Thank you.